the suburb of Glendale, Los Angeles, 1931. Once farmland. But men came, real estate men, property speculators. Within months, houses, thousands of houses, grew where once had been only farmland. In the kitchen, I put the final touches of icing on a cake. My husband comes through the door. Gee, Mildred, that's some cake. Guess I'll take a walk down the block. You're going to be home for supper, Bert? I'll try. I want to know. I told you. That's I'm... no good. I'm making this cake for Mrs. Whitley. She's paying me three dollars. If you're home for supper, I'll spend it on lamb chops. If not, I'll buy something the children like better. Getting at something, Mildred? She waiting for you? Who? You know. If you're talking about Maggie Biterhoff, I haven't seen her in a week. Is it my fault a guy can't find work these days? What do you do, Bert? Unbutton that red dress she wears without any brassiere underneath. Flop her on the bed. Do your stuff. Get up. See if there's some cold chicken in the icebox. Play some rummy, then flop her on the bed again. How'd you like to go to hell? I stop icing the cake. Look at him. Speak little of love, fidelity. Instead of money. His failure to get it. Provide for the children. Me. He starts to move. You going to Maggie Biderhoff's? Suppose I am. Then pack and leave now. Oh, keep on, Mildred, keep on. One of these days I'll call you out. I'm calling you. I go where I goddamn please. Pack, Bert. Go. I'll break it to the children. He goes. I step back from the cake so my tears don't smudge the icing. Then, realize he's taken the car so I can't deliver the cake. Mother? <gasps> Vida! You made me jump. Why are you crying? Uh, me crying? Who's the cake for? Bob Whitley. His graduation. Hmm. The newspaper boy. A good boy, Vida. Graduated cum laude. Happens to believe in working to supplement his income. How was your piano lesson? Mother. Vida? Where's father? He had to go somewhere. Why did he take his clothes? He's gone away. Where? Vida stands there, arms akimbo, eyeing me. Is he coming back, mother? No. I see. I just wanted to know. Mom, Harry Smith squirted me. Ah, oh, Ray. <laughs> My little Ray. How was school today? He squirted me with... Gee, cake. Can you keep your hands off that cake? Just a little nibble. Ray. Ray, my younger daughter. With the help of some unused cake mix, I tell her of her father. That there are things I can't talk about. Tears. Hugs. But all the time I'm reaching out to Vida, a few feet off. What do you mean by things I can't talk about, Mrs. Biederhoff, mother? I quite agree. Mrs. Biederhoff is distinctly middle class. <laughs> <laughs> I use her silliness to hug her. Then send them off to Bert's parents to ask if I can borrow their car to deliver the cake. Afterwards, put the children to bed. Take my clothes off. I'm alone. All alone. Stand before the mirror amid all the darkness, naked. Mildred Pierce swear I will not be defeated. I will fight for my children. Reality soon starts to break in. <laughs> A bill. Third notice. Unless this bill is paid in five days. <sighs> Using my money from the cakes I sell around the neighborhood, I walk two miles to the gas company. Pay. Walk two miles to the market. Buy a quarter of hot dogs. 
vegetables, a quart of milk, a chicken. The children are invited to their grandparents for the weekend to see Bert. I needn't have bought the chicken. Doorbell? Oh, hi, Wally. Mildred, Bert around? No. Do you know where he went? No. All right. Yeah, it's a problem at the office. Some deal Bert set up before he left. Ask him if he could drop over, would you? Wally. Mildred? Bert's not living here anymore. What? He... He went away. You busted up? Yeah. For good? Yes. For a moment, his eyes dropped to my legs. They're bare. I'm saving my stockings. Then away to hide where he glanced. Well, Mildred, what are you doing with yourself, then? Oh, I managed to keep busy. You don't look busy. A Saturday. Taking a day off. What you doing tonight? Oh, why, nothing that I know of. Then it's a date. That's what we'll do. We'll step out. <laughs> if I haven't forgotten how. Oh, you'll know how. Gee, Mildred, you're a fast worker. Lucy Gessler, my neighbor. The children are away for the weekend. And now Bert's gone. Do I know him? Wally Bergen. The lawyer? I didn't know he was interested in you. <laughs> Neither did I. But the second he heard Bert was gone, well, it was almost funny. Funny? You don't know these men. You realize what you are now, Mildred? No. You're fast. You're game. You're serious. Deadly. <laughs> Honey. Lucy. Is Wally married? No. What are you doing tonight? Well, going out, having dinner, I guess. Mistake number one. Don't let that clock buy your dinner. But Give him a Mildred Pierce special. A meal when he's willing to... Baby, why is he taking you out? To show the high regard he holds you in? Ha! Fat chance. In addition to being dirty bastards and very dumb clucks, men are also goddamn liars. They take us out so that we'll Don't stop Don't worry. Nothing will happen. Oh, 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 something will happen. If not tonight, then some other night. Because if it don't, he'll lose interest, and you won't like that. And when it happens, it's sin. Because you're a loose woman, and he's all paid up because he bought you a meal. But if you bought him a meal and cooked it the way only you can cook... All the while, slipping him cocktails and scotch I can let you have. Lucy? If anything happens, you're not a loose woman. You're a good little housewife in a cute little apron. And he'll do the only honorable thing a man can do. Marry you. Lucy, do you think I want to be kept? Yes. Terrible night, Mildred. Let's go. Go? Gee, Wally, I never dreamed you'd want to go out on a night like this. Uh, isn't that what we agreed? Oh, it's so awful. Uh, Why don't I fix you something here? I I've got some really good gin and scotch. Then I could cook some chicken. Chicken? He eats like a baby. All the time talking about the chicken his mother made back home in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I nip upstairs to slip on something more comfortable. My dress is over my head when... Who's that? Me, Mildred. Thought you might need some help twanging them apron strings. Where's the light? No! Oh, my God! Get out of here, Wally! Gee, Mildred, sorry. I swear, it was only a joke. <sighs> Hell, you know I wouldn't pull any cheap tricks like that. But, oh, Mildred. Wally. <laughs> Wally. Wally Bergen. Can't a girl do any better? Then I remember, if we don't go downstairs again, the bottle of whiskey stays unopened. 
I could get six dollars for it under the counter. So, how was last night? All fine and dandy, Lucy. But I found out one thing. I don't want to marry Wally Bergen. Meanwhile, 1932. Darkness deepens. The president makes speeches on the radio. The girls still get their milk every day, Vita her piano lessons, but a large mortgage repayment looms. I hunt the situation's vacant columns. Salesmen, office workers, accountants, receptionists. Nothing. But I have a deeper fear than even this. I love my daughter, Vida, very much. Admire her. She is as all people should be. Proud. Her pride makes me proud. If she was ever to find out I was looking for menial work. While they're at school, I trek from office to office. Sorry, no vacancies today. Department store to department store. Sorry, no married women. Cursing that Bert took the car. My shoe leather scuffing and wearing, but the smile on my face never wavering. Until... I'm telling you straight, there ain't no work. The crowds. Great black crowds thunder past, searching, searching. I haven't eaten properly in weeks. I'm Mildred Pierce from Glendale. Oh, gotta sit down. Lurch into a cafe to spend my last few cents on coffee. Something to brace me. Oh. Coffee, please, and a glass of water. Hey, there was a tip on this table. I, I didn't notice. I bet there was a 20-cent tip on this table. It's gone. I didn't take it. Honest. Could I please have coffee? The waitress goes off muttering. I disappear into a haze of... Two waitresses, one of them mine, fighting. The manager, a fat little Greek, separates them, sacks the thief. The food's cleared off the floor. Service resumes, but it's half-hearted. Customers complain. Not enough waitresses. Something turns inside me. I realize. Get up. A job, however humble, is offering itself. Vida needs those piano lessons. I stand, walk toward the kitchen, pray, plead, cry with the manager. The girl from my table takes my side. He gives me a two-hour trial. Pays 25 cents an hour. Keep your tips. The menu. Thanks. Learn it by heart. Any mistake, it comes straight off your wages. Capiche? Capiche. Mr. McAdooley's put you on a light station. Tables three, four, five, six. A boost by the wall, so you don't get no fours. Twos and singles are easier. Good. Well, get going. That's customers out there. Right. <laughs> the next two hours are hell. Customers, prices, shouting. Finally, it slows. I discover I gave two wrong checks, so I only get 20 cents for the day. But that doesn't worry me. After Ida's gone to work on him, Mr. McAdoulis says I can stay. Catch bus home. Arrive two minutes before children. Hide my uniform. Ray rushes out to join the other kids in the street. While Vida plays the piano in the living room. But... Then, all that walking, all them crowds and shouting and pushing. Suddenly it urges up in my stomach. The bathroom. Mildred? Mildred! Oh, God. What? 
work in a hash house, wear a uniform, take their tips. One of them grabbed my fanny, fell right off. Mildred, Mildred, how much do they pay you? 25 cents an hour. And tips extra? Yeah. Baby, you're nuts. Those tips will bring in $2 a day. You'll be making, what, $20 a week. More than you've had since Bert's job blew. But, uh, Honey, you're on a spot. It's all right to be proud. I love you for it. But you're starving to death. You've got to. You've got to. No, so quit no. calling. Promise me one thing, Lucy. Anything. Don't tell anyone about this. Especially Vita. Vita? She wouldn't like it. God damn what she likes. Lucy, you don't understand. Vita has something in her. I thought I had. But now I find I have pride. Nothing on earth would make Vita do what I'm doing. That fooey. Wouldn't do it herself, but let Shh, you. Lucy. Listen to her. She's going to have things I never could. Doorbell. I better leave. Bert. Mildred. How are you? Can't complain. Thought I'd drop around, pick up a couple of things. Um, come in. The children see him. He charges round with Ray on his back. Gravely discusses the world situation with Vida. Then there's that awkward silence before someone leaves. Vida fills it. Aren't you terribly thirsty, Father? Mm -hmm. Mother, would you like me to get that scotch? Vida. Scotch? Well, if I was coaxed... I am livid. The scotch I was saving for an emergency. I go upstairs. Can I help, Mother? Who asked you to snoop around my closet? I didn't know there was any secret. Don't stand there all innocent. You had no business doing what you did, and you know it. Very well, Mother. It shall be as you say. And stop talking in that silly way. Yes, Mother. How does she do it? How does she make me feel so inferior? Why does she hurt me so? <laughs> oh, no. oh, stop tickling. <laughs> oh, stop that. After much merriment, the children go to bed. A devil enters me. Bert's car is mine. Should be. His jacket hangs in the hallway, the car keys in the pocket. I'm working. I need the car. So I take the keys, whether Bert likes it or not. Would you like me to ride you back? Mm, appreciate that very much. Drive him to the widow Biderhoff's. He gets out, solemnly thanks me for an enjoyable evening dives for the key but I palm it <laughs> didn't work uh, I guess not night Bert I I've got a couple of Oprah's ears she can have them anytime she wants I have my own car I Mildred Pierce who live in Glendale but work downtown have my own car drive it up Colorado Boulevard. Traffic signals are clear, so I give it the gun. 30, 40, 50, 60. Breathe in deep and dark, the whole black car shuddering, lurching through the night. Me, Mildred Pierce, in charge of my life. Back home, slip into Vita's bedroom. 
Vida. Mother? Something very nice happened tonight. You were the cause. I take back everything I said. <laughs> Thank you, Mother. Now perhaps I can go back to sleep. I learn waitressing. Practice balancing plates, adding bills in my head when the children sleep. Flirt with male customers, even let one feel up my skirt so he leaves a bigger tip. In a month, I'm the best in L.A. One thing is wrong, though. The pies, the awful pies they serve in that place. I think Macadoulis gets his pies from the Handy Baking Company, 35 cents each. I could make better pies in the evenings for 30 and still show a profit. Ida and me go to work on Macadoulis, but he's happy Handy Baking Pie suits him fine. So, one day, I steal in an apple, a pumpkin, a lemon pie. By noon, the lemons are smear on an empty plate. One by one, all have gone. We approach Mr. McAdoulis. See how quick them pies went? Guys was coming up for third portions using unpolite language when they was told there was no more. I can do them five cents cheaper for you, Mr. McAdoulis, and better quality. So, you're gonna buy her pies or not? He does. Every night I bake them. The customers like them. Word spreads. People in the neighborhood buy them. Another restaurant. I make $8 a week waitressing, 15 in tips, 10 clear from the pies. 1933 comes. I pay the mortgage. The next day, hire a maid to mind the children. Only one thing must never happen. Vita find out I'm a waitress. One day I get home. Letty, the maid, is dressed in my waitress uniform. Letty? I told her you wouldn't like it, Mrs. Pierce, right off. But she hollered and carried on, so I put it on just to keep her quiet. Who? Miss Vida, ma'am. Miss Vida? She makes me call her that. I wait till Letty goes home. I hold an inquest. These uniforms were in the top of my closet. How did you find them? I was looking for my handkerchiefs, Mother. <laughs> Shut up, Ray. You know where your hankies are, Vida. You were snooping. Mother! Secondly, why did you give one of them to Letty? I assumed, Mother, you'd forgotten to tell her to wear them. Evidently, they'd been bought for her. If she was going to carry my things to the public pool, I naturally public wanted pool? to decently... Public pool? What things? My swimming things, Mother. <laughs> Vida got Letty to carry them down the street to the pool and walk two yards behind us. What? <laughs> really, Mother, you're making a great fuss over nothing. If you bought that uniform for her, and certainly I can't imagine who else you could have bought it for, then why shouldn't she wear it? A sick feeling in my gut. I send Ray to bed. Why did you give Letty that uniform? Heavens, Mother, I told you once... I'm going to bed. Stay right here. You knew it was mine, didn't you? Your uniform? That's right, Mother. Slap me. I've taken a job downtown as a waitress. A what? A waitress, as you very well know. <laughs> Egods. <laughs> Egods and little fishes. Ow. So you can eat. You can have piano lessons. How you found out, I don't know. <laughs> From your uniform, stupid. Aren't the pies bad enough? Did you have to degrade us both? I don't know. There's something about Vida. I can never say anything to her. Catch hold of her, jerk her across my knee, pull up her dress, strike, strike, strike. Blackness. Strike and strike till I can no more. Then let her slide to the floor. Sit, fighting sick in my stomach. Oh. Uh.
waitress. <laughs> I don't understand. Don't. Whenever I fight a poser, this dark force rises within me. But she always has a darker, harder force. You never give me any credit for finer feelings, do you? Oh, Mother, please. You're working downtown as a waitress. I'll try not to think about it. But... As always, after a fight with Vida, something within me changes. From that night, I start to watch the restaurant, the business, anew. When the bills are paid, where he buys his food, bookkeeping, marketing, presentation. I learn. Learn I could run a restaurant, not a downtown restaurant. A Glendale restaurant. Read the trade magazines. If I bought a range, icebox, steam table, sink, furniture, dishes, silver, linen, then costs for staff and premises, I'd be looking at a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. Hello? Wally? Hey, Mildred. How are you? Wally... You want to help me on something? Well, that depends. I, I need an estimate of costs for someone who might back me in a business. What kind of business? A restaurant. Hey, a restaurant with your cooking. <laughs> yeah, that's some idea, Mildred. He hurries over, excited. It's amazing. While I was driving, I worked out this deal. Yes? A deal so great, you won't even need a backer. Wally... I'll cry. Cry later. You know that model home down the street? The dream house the real estate company took their prospects around to show what their place would look like if they spent twice as much as any of them had? Yes. Ideal place to convert into a restaurant? Yes. The company went bust. The receivers appointed me the attorney to try and sell it. They're desperate. So, I sell it to you for $4,000. $4,000? Wally, one, that house is worth a lot more. Two, I haven't got $4,000. Okay. One, the receivers, they're like everyone else. Got to establish losses against tax. Mm -hmm. 4000 bucks. All their tax losses for 1934 dealt with. Two, in this town, like any other, the second you own property, you borrow against it. You think these credit houses aren't suffering like everyone else? They're desperate to lend money. You pay off the 4000 buy your supplies and staff. Wally! I can't believe it. It's perfect. Perfect. He's right. It is perfect. Amazing. In a country with so little money, so few jobs... If you know the right places, the right levers, suddenly money flows from the darkest, driest desert. I, Mildred Pierce, buy the house, raise credit on it, supervise the builder's conversion, haggle with supply companies. I, me, my business starts to raise itself. I supervise the setting in of stoves, purchase of cutlery, plates, white tablecloths, internal decor. All so me, my children, Vida, little Ray, Vida especially, might have security. Finally, it's my last day waitressing. In a few hours, all I'll have to remind myself of downtown will be the stink of bacon fat in my hair. I'm coming out of the kitchen. Sitting in number seven, dark, handsome, wearing an old, slightly patched jacket, slightly worn flannels. He puts down the menu. What the hell am I looking at the menu for? 
All I want is coffee. <laughs> to find out the price? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to order? Well, <clears throat> I think I'll have a coffee. White or black? Dirty gray. Boot polish brown. Boot polish brown. And if you show a turn of speed, I'll be in Arrowhead in time for a swim before sundown. Oh, gee, I wish I could go to Arrowhead. <laughs> Why not come? Hey, you better look out. I might say yes. I come back. He's still looking. I meant it. And I told you to look out. Maybe I'll do it. You know what would be a highly original thing for you to do? <laughs> no. Say yes right away. Like that. I look at him. Dark eyes, slightly olive skin, long, thin wrists. My children are away for the weekend. I'm free, independent. But what is he, casual, so assured, doing in a place like this? Well... By four, we're racing through Pasadena in a big blue cord roadster. Your name? Pierce. Mildred Pierce. What's yours? Baragon. French? Spanish. My great-great-grandfather was one of the original settlers. You know, the gay caballeros that jipped the Indians out of their land. Oh! <laughs> but if you ask me, the old coot was really a wop. And your first name? Montgomery. But I'll answer to Monty. His real name? So he isn't just slumming. Only one thing bothers me now. The stink of bacon fat in my hair. His hut by Lake Arrowhead. Shut up for two months, so now it's hot. Hot as a sauna bath in July. Rather embarrassed, two strangers, we change in separate rooms. I grab some soap, race for the water. A mother of two children... I dive deep, deep down into cold, cold water, frantically push soap through my hair again and again till every trace of bacon fat washes away. There you are! You look like a drowned rat. Oh, you should see yourself! Uh-huh! A churn of threshing, scything limbs, grabs and screams pursuit through the cold water till he grabs me up, carries me, kicks open the door, and suddenly the sluggish, restful warmth of the hut embraces me, lulls me. He has me upon the bed, my costume off, kissing, caressing, then growing harder, the darkness all about me, forgetting, not wishing to remember Vida, little Ray, as I slip Swim, slide into. All weekend, shutters shut fast. Darkness, heat, darkness. Once or twice we even talk. What do you do, Monty? Oh, I don't know. Fruit, I guess. Uh, Oranges, grapefruit. Juggle with them. Uh, on the exchange? No, I don't. Uh, you're an independent? I own part of a fruit company. Oh. Every quarter they send me a check. I don't do anything. Oh, you just... Loaf? You can call it that, I suppose. Something in me disapproves. But something else giggles. A loafer might be in bed with a waitress. But the waitress isn't what she appears. We drive home. So, you're living Glendale. Glendale. Left here... Down Colorado Boulevard. Suddenly it's before us. A great blue and red neon sign. Mildred's. Opens Friday. What? Is this yours? <laughs> My name, isn't it? Your waitress. Last week. Opens Friday? Yes. I'll be there. 
he drops me at my drive. I'm still chuckling as I walk up the... Mildred, is that you? Lucy? Honey, where have you been? Oh, have I got a Mildred, story? Mildred, for... we've been trying to reach you. Y- yeah? It's Ray. Ray? Honey, I'm sure everything's all right, but... But? She got hit by a car. She's in the hospital. Sweet Jesus. For those sins I have committed. Somehow I get to hospital. Beda, Bert, his parents, looking at me. This is Pierce. Doctor. You mustn't get along. We think things are under control. Ray, darling. It's Mama. Mama. Her poor, broken little body all covered in bandages. Mrs. Pierce, you'd better leave. The chill, Doctor. Reaction to the transfer. The oxygen of adrenaline ice. Her little face turns white, then blue. Teeth chatter. Orderlies arrive with cylinders, syringes. What? Take those hot water bottles out. Her face loses its blue. Red spots appear in her cheeks. Temperature's rising, Doctor. Take off the blankets. Pulse 124, 125. Pack those ice bags around. I can't touch her. I can't move. One move on my part might for one second distract one person from their vital role. I watch. I owed her a nickel. I never gave it her back. There, Vida. Well, you wanted to pay her back. That's the main thing. Now stop crying. She forgives you. Mother, do you think I could practice my piano? Jeez, that child. They feel things different to us, Bert. Yes, honey. Run along. Thank you, Mommy. That night, after I've made my pies... We sit in darkness, me and Bert, mourning our child. I stand at the graveside. The casket lowers. I... She's... If I had not fallen into darkness. Vida goes to the cinema. I'm alone in the house. She comes back with tales of Alyssa Landy shooting Lionel Barrymore. Vida. Mother? Would you like to sleep with me tonight, darling? Oh, Mother, of course. What you must have been through. It's dark. We lie, her head on my shoulder. A few sobs. She sleeps. Then very slowly, in the darkness, I allow something deep, deep within me to release, arise. A joy, fierce, dark, Joy, it was not Vida who died, that she lives still, breathing softly on my shoulder. I dedicate my life, each atom in my being, to her, Vida. Up at dawn. The restaurant opens tonight. I will not let her down. Staff already hired. I drive to the farm to choose the chickens. Reject two because they're underweight. At five, Wally arrives. Three separate guys. Three separate guys said there was coming. 5.30, change into my dress. 
sit and wait. The staff shuffle and whisper. What if no one comes? Check the waffle irons to see they're hot. Car door outside. Another. Things start to buzz. More at number nine. Soup right and left. One more. Uh, crackers of butter. Salad to go, eh? Hey. Trouble at number three. Kid don't want soup. Insists on tomato juice with a squeeze of lemon. I think I know who that is. Sure enough, Vida and Bert. My God, you got yourself a business, Mildred. This is real. I think you've done very well, Mother. Mm. All things considered. Say, Mildred, get ready. You got a mob outside, a mob. A mob, indeed. In minutes, chaos. Two girls just come in, Mrs. Pierce. I got room for one, but should we shut off together? No. Hey, he's a washing the plates and leaving the soap on. Shall I clear five, Mrs. Pierce? Oh, God. Hi, baby. Ida? I think I desert you in your hour of need. Move over and set them oh. chickens rolling. Hi, Mildred. Lucy. Hey, listen, I'll go out front. Keep the natives restful. In ten minutes, we're coping. In thirty, we're on top. Mother! Vida? You'll never guess who just came in. Who? Monty Barragon. And who is Monty Barragon? Don't you know? No. Plays polo, lives in Pasadena, terribly rich. All the girls just wait for his picture in the paper. He's keen. Ooh. Say, Monty Barragon, if that guy's here, you're made. Isn't that so, Bert? Mm, he's very well known. Known? Hell, he's a shot. By 11, the last customers leave. A group gathers. Bert and Monty discuss polo. Vida curls into Bert's arms, staring at Monty. The drink goes round. Jeez, Mildred, they really went for them chickens. It's gonna do real grand, Mildred. <laughs> they really went for them chickens. <laughs> Monty drives Vida and me home stays to chat. I should send her to bed, but I've never known Vita so warm, so touching, curling into me as she stares at Monty. 1935, the restaurant thrives. Monty, me, and Vita make a strange triangle. Monty and me, physically extraordinary, very... Uh, but he looks down on me, calls my restaurant the pie wagon. I ignore it because Monty makes me intimate with Vida, takes her to Polo, the family mansion where she plays the piano before his mother and sister, practices night and day, needs a grand piano. I'll save $20 a week, give her one for Christmas. But Monty is turning sour. Endless catty references to suburbs, my style of dress, in nightclubs, doesn't spread his money as once he did. Eventually, Vida... Of course, Mother, you've heard. Heard? How the House of Barragon is finished. Pfft, for down oop-a-doop wango. You mean that... It's all over Pasadena. Apparently they had some stock in a bank and it was accessible. Well, whatever that means. So when the bank went, pfft, so did they. Went, pfft. And there's a huge for sale sign with Monty showing buyers round. Their mansion. With iron dogs out front and peacocks out back. <laughs> a buyer had better show up pronto, or Monty will be eating the peacocks. I half love her flipness, half loathe it. Later. Monty, do you need money? Oh, Lord, no. I think you do. Mildred, I've, well, I've run into a little bad luck, but it's nothing that involves small amounts. I can still hold up my end. You want to play in that game? No. Here, $20. No. Yes. No. Please. Please. For Vita's sake. Alone. All right. I'll pay you back. He has his polo match. 
No one tells me the result. My loans increase. Vida won't get her piano for Christmas. I resent this. He resents me. Oh, Mildred. How much tonight? Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Your hired gigolo thanks you. Monty, when are you going to get work? As soon as I've sold that damned house. You really wanted to sell it, you'd give it to an agent. But you prefer to live on Orange Grove Avenue and cook eggs in the morning and drive to the club in the afternoon and have your dinner here with Vida and take your spending money from me for the night, don't you? Sure. I don't know anyone I'd rather take money from than you, Mildred. Monty. <laughs> your pay gigolo is well satisfied. Get on that bed. Monty, let go. Sure, get on that bed. No. We get scratch on. and tear. Monty. Scratch yeah. and tear as we make love like bleak, black animals. Christmas 1936. Vida expects her piano. Instead... I get her a $70 watch. Christmas morning. Vida paces up and down outside. Nine o'clock. Mother, may I come in? Of course, darling. Oh, Mother, you darling, you absolute... She stops. There's lots of presents... Your father's, your grandparents, one for me. Christ, but I hate this dump. Vida, I said, Christ, but I hate this dump. What in particular do you object to? Oh, nothing in particular. Just every lousy, stinking part of it. And were it to burn down tomorrow... I wouldn't shed a furtive tear from the Elixir of Love by Gitano Donizetti. 1798 to 1848. Takes out a cigarette. Lights it. Put out that cigarette. Like hell. <coughs> she slaps me back. Blows smoke in my face. Glendale. Forty square miles of nothing. A dump for people who run filling stations, furniture factories, and pie wagons. Where did you hear that? Pie wagon. <laughs> you poor sap. You really think he'll marry you? Monty. Monty. If I were willing, yes. <laughs> he guards and little fishes. Don't you know what he sees in you? About what you see, I think. Your legs. He told you that. We're very good friends. He has a theory. Why sleep with the mistress when you can sleep with the maid? The best legs are always in the kitchen. I can't focus. I can't think. Then... After all, even in his darkest days, his shoes are custom made. <laughs> they ought to be. They cost me enough. <sighs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> You buy his shoes. He guards and little... His fish. shoes and shirts and polo dues. It's not my legs he likes. It's my money. That's why he's such a good friend of yours. Not because he likes you. He's always complaining about your childish ways. But because he has to. He'll marry me, not marry me, do anything I damned well say just so his gentlemanly little belly gets its daily fill. That ends Christmas. But not Monty. With him, I wait. One day, we're invited to a party. The best clothes, Lucy. I've got to have the very best clothes. I've got a brocade coat, crusted in gold. Lovely. Gold stockings, gold shoes. Calm down, honey. Pick him up. Wonderful evening. Drive him home. He steps out. Invites me in. Instead, I roll down the window. Say, how nice it's been, but all good things must come to an end. Bye-bye. Monty, open-mouthed, 
watches his gravy train roll off down the drive. Honey. Lucy. Things don't always work out how you plan them. This one will. How do I look? Like a Viking goddess sent to wreak vengeance. Oh. Missy Pierce, radio says folks ain't to go out. Oh. She's right, honey. The worst storms in 20 years. There's rivers running down Colorado Avenue. Lucy, this man worms his way into the heart of my family. Poisons my relationship with my Vida. I'll destroy the bastard. <laughs> Some water on the road. Stones and branches, nothing serious. Two men tell me to cut through the hills to Pasadena, then go down Pennsylvania Boulevard. In one place, the road is almost blocked, but I squeeze past. I'm in Pasadena. What's all the fuss? Mildred? How do I look? Magnificent, but how did you get here? In my car. Ready for the party? Of course not. All three bridges into Los Angeles are swept away. For God's sake, come in. Come in. He stares at me. We go through the great rooms. Furniture covered in ghostly shrouds. Up a back staircase to the servants' quarters. I have a drink. A second. Third. My plan is in ruins. He pours a fourth. How could you do it? Do what? Tell her. My child, Vida, about us. Vida? A child? Vida's forgotten more things than you'll ever know. She even asks how often we make love. And you tell her. She admires my capacity. But yours, she can't get over. Who'd think the poor moat had it in her? And how about your saying the best legs are always found in the kitchen? What are you talking about? You know. Oh! <laughs> One afternoon we were in town, past a girl in maid's uniform. I said that. <laughs> That's all. A snake-like flicker across his eye. You're lying. Oh, no. You take my daughter, poison her to look down on Glendale. Look down on Glendale. You don't complain when Glendale pays your bills. Complain. Complain. You listen to me a while, you little kitchen tart. You complain I've turned your daughter against you. I don't treat you like a lady. Want to know what a lady is? A lady would cut out her heart before she let me know the money she lends me matters. But you... You rub every cent in. Turn me into a lackey. A poodle. Vita's got more damned laziness in her little finger than you've got in your entire body. <sighs> what this needs is a case of old-fashioned rape. Keep off me. No. Yes! <laughs> Things become serious. Deadly. Blows. Curses. Somehow I fight my way out through the ghostly house to the car. The storm's at its height. Trees crash. Boulders roll. A wild, black, terrible night. Up Pennsylvania. But Eagle Rock's blocked by landslides. Back up, down Wisconsin, but it's full of rubble. Drive slow. Rolling. Breaking. Rolling. Breaking. Suddenly, ahead... Clear, shiny, black road. I accelerate. Too late, realize it's pure black running water two feet deep. I'm caught, swept a hundred yards, jammed against a curb. Water pours in. A figure, a creature, grimacing, clawing at the window. Drags it open, heaves me to a nearby bank. I'm sorry. Get away. Get away. Mildred. Mildred, I'm sorry. Somehow I'm losing in the darkness. 
Dressed like a Viking goddess, I get home. I don't know how, but I'm free. Free of Monty Barragon. Nineteen thirty seven. Life at last prospers. The pies become a separate business. I open two further restaurants, Ida managing both. Vida gets her grand piano. All is sweetness and light. I know no greater joy after a hard day's work than to creep into my house, slip off my shoes, lie on a sofa, listen to my daughter play. She must have a new music teacher, a Signor Treviso, apparently the best in town. Ring up the Two hours he's kept us waiting. Mother, he's a wop. We wait. Eventually, he ushers us in. Play! For a few seconds, he listens, then stalks across, shuts the piano lid. It is no good. Bye-bye. Excuse me, that is my mother, daughter. Mother, we're going. Already she's by the door, putting on her gloves. But, for God's sake, Mother, come! Back home. Kill it. Drive a knife through it. You never were any good. Vida, that was just a very rude man's opinion. Oh, you stupid cluck. You think I'm good. You are good. You know what I am. A Glendale wunderkind. One like me in every vulgar little suburb on earth. After all that work with Mr. Hannon. Work? You don't understand. In this racket, you're either a genius or nothing. For a week, she lies on her bed. Then rises, demands money, expensive clothes, striking red lipstick. <laughs> Runs with a crowd of rich Hollywood children. Asleep when I wake, out when I return. Instead of watching, guarding, I waste time on my business. Fate is not so blind. I'm Mrs. Lenhart, the film director's wife. I'm sure we can work our little problem out. Problem? Our children, Mrs. Pierce. Our babies. Uh, pardon? Your little one, Vida. Such a lovely girl. My boy. Mrs. Lenhart, what are you talking about? Mrs. Pierce. You mean Vida hasn't told you anything? No. They're part of this crowd... Some of them quite adorable. Well, love at first sight must have been because that boy of mine is so sincere, so... They're engaged? I wouldn't say engaged. In fact, I know Sammy has no such thing in mind. But Vida... Vida? Mrs. Pierce, if you or that girl employ any more tricks, I shall prevent this marriage. By legal means, if must be. And if there are any more threats, any more tricks... I'll have her arrested for blackmail. Understood. In my house, I sit all alone. What? What? For once, I must have the truth. No bending. No wavering. I sit up. At four, she comes in. Vida? Mother... We must talk. Well, at least let me wash my face. No. Now. If you insist. I've just been to the most boring Nelson Eddy. Vida. A Mrs. Lenhart came to see me. 
Oh? She says you're engaged to her son. Or something. What else did she say? She's against it. She would be. I must hold myself. Not give way. She came here. She said to me that you... <sighs> yes, Mother? She said... What? Somehow, looming out of the darkness, an even greater darkness, I can't... can't. Darling, what was she talking about? Are you going to get married? Perhaps. Darling, are you pregnant? And she drops her little head. Yes. I'll have him arrested. Oh, Mother. I phone Bert. Bert's emotional, but no use. I phone Wally. He agrees to come next morning. Mother. Darling. You should know. I've already met Wally. Met? Hired him as my lawyer. The kid comes in a dough on his 21st. Six figures at least. There's no way his mother or father can keep him out of it. That's what this is all about. It's all it's about. Wally! Mildred. You knew Vita was pregnant, but you didn't tell me. Uh, confidentiality of the client. But no. I'm mother. your... Anyhow, the thing is, the kid skipped. Skipped? To avoid legal proceedings. I want him arrested. I get a private detective. Uh, he's at this ranch in Arizona. Then get the police on the phone. Oh, all right, I will. Mother. Vida? Sit down. The police will bring him back here. He'll want to marry me. I don't want to marry him. I'd much rather have his money. She was right. You're blackmailing him. You're not pregnant at all. Mother, at this stage it's a matter of opinion. In my opinion, I am. Vida, if you'd loved him, I wouldn't have minded. To love is... But to pretend you love to get money. How could you? By following my mother. What? Hook a man when he's rich, throw him out when he's poor. You think... Vida, don't I give you all the money you want? Why are you doing this? You want to know? Don't be a fool. Don't rush in. Let the blackness engulf. But I do. I love her. Tell me. To get enough money to escape from this shack you blackmailed my father out of with threats about Mrs. Biederhoff. To escape from Glendale. Your pie wagon. You. Come on, Wally. Uh, where are you going? An appointment with their lawyers. They've agreed to settle. You go. You'll never come back here. Mother, you'll never turn me out. You'll find your belongings all along Colwick Drive. You mean it? Yes. I mean it! She leaves in fury. But mine is greater. Frightening. She'll learn. She'll return. Months pass. I imagine her alone on the streets, bruised, cold, me cradling her in my arms, breathing in her hair's soft scent, her pleading to return, me allowing it. It's not quite like that. She gets a small apartment. I don't hear from her. Hello? Mildred? Bert. I got some tickets. Tickets? To the broadcast. Broadcast? Yes, the one Vita's giving. Vita's giving a broadcast? Playing the piano? Singing, from what I hear. 
Singing? Yeah. Where'd you learn to sing? I don't know, honey. Check it in the paper. Hank Somerville's Snack You Ham Hour on NBC. Why can't Vita phone me? Honey, I don't know what's going on between you. She's probably rehearsing. <laughs> Hank Somerville's Snack You Ham Hour? Torch singing with some big band. Mildred, she's our kid. Look, why don't we listen to it at your place? She's our daughter. It was her home. And now, folks, we got a gal. And what a gal. Excuse me while I fade away. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Vita Pierce. Now, uh, tell me, tell me. Vita, is, is Pierce your real name? Why, sure it is, Hank. Oh, it's not because your voice is so piercing. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, folks, we chose Vita tonight because her music's a little uh, special. We sure you'll appreciate Je Veux Vivre from Romeo and Juliet. This is classical music. Mildred. Come over to the radio. I stay by the door. She starts to sing. My Veda. My... Where she learned to sing like this. I'm drawn toward the radio. My... Gee, listen to that. Where did she learn it? At the end, cheers, shouts. All I ever wanted, dreamed of... But she must come to me, not me to her. Every night I drive by her apartment. Two months later, she switches from Hank Somerville to the Treviso Hour, the same man who shut the piano on her. He must be her teacher. Mr. Treviso? Madame? You might remember me. I came with my daughter, Vida. You turned her down. So? Firstly, could you tell me why you're now teaching her singing? It's easy. I knew Chalianon. You say maybe she got something in her voice. Then your girl come to me with money, beg me to teach her. I listen, see yes. Mr. Treviso, I want to pay her bills. Not possible. You want to hear your girl sing, you buy a ticket. It's not a question of money. No, by God, it is not. You go to a zoo, see a little snake from India, all red, yellow, black. You take home, make a little pet like puppy dog. No, you got more sense. Same with Vida. Are you calling my daughter a snake? No, far worse. A coloratura soprano. A little snake a love mama, love papa. But a coloratura soprano love nobody but God himself. And the richer people. Nice people? A richer a people. Oh. All culture are crazy for rich people. All borrow 10,000 bucks, go to Italy, study voice. Never pay back. Sing in grand opera, marry a banker, get the money, kick out the banker, marry the baron, get the title. Then come a decoration from King of Belgium. Mr. Treviso, we're all entitled to our opinions, but if you could send me your bills, I'm a successful No. Bill. Why? Because your daughter, a snake, and I no enjoy snake bite. You try make me play little intrigue to get your daughter back. Never. For last few months, ever since Snuckerham broadcast, little bitch tell me her poor dumb mother tried to get her back. First thing she do is come here, offer pay for singing lessons. This girl live for two things. Get back with all the rich people she knew in Pasadena. And make a mother feel bad. 
There isn't much in my life. My business, my work, goes on. My love life? <laughs> She is my only meaning. Every path, every crevice closed. Except one. I phone Monty. Say I'm thinking of buying a house in Pasadena. Ask for his advice. We drive around looking at houses. None seem right. I drive him back to his house. Dirty, derelict, furniture long since gone, paper hanging from the walls. Oh, Monty, look at it. I try not to. What it once was. I've got the sauce bottle it's somewhere. It's funny, it's almost... Almost what? How much do you want for this, Monty? What? How much? It's almost... Of course, it would all have to be done up. You're not serious. I am. He stands before me, thin, shabby, a bald patch growing. Thirty-three thousand? About. Sounds fair. <laughs> Mildred... You want to buy... A... You were talking about a drink. Sure. He gets it. We sit on an old settee. How are you, Monty? Fine. And you? Very well. Mildred, the house... Yes? I said 33,000, but for you it'll be 29,580. Mm. Which will pay off every cent I owe you. Understood? I catch his little finger. He pulls it back. I catch it again. Oh, gentlemen in my circumstances don't have a great deal of romance in their lives. If you keep that up, you might find yourself the victim of some raveling brute. I let his little finger drop. I have a slightly different proposal. Yes? If I buy this house, you come with it. You entertain our friends. You behave yourself. Understood? He swallows. For a second gives me a look of... What? Hatred? then bows his head. Monty has great style. Taste. I let him restore the house. 1938. We marry. He plays polo again, starts to mingle with his old friends. I work at my business. But no sign of Vida. Then, one day I'm summoned home. Walk up the steps. The front door swings open before me. I float in. A sea of faces. Flowers. But all I can see coming towards me. Arms outstretched. Taking. Embracing kissing me, the smell of her hair once more, Vida. <laughs> the party's a dream, hardly remember it, but at the end, the three of us on the sofa, together again. As Monty and I go to bed, I slip into her room. Kiss her. Kiss her hard on the mouth. Kiss her and kiss her. Return to my room. Monty. <laughs> Mildred. I want to sleep alone tonight. Could you sleep in another room? Of course. Of course, old girl.
alone. All alone in darkness I lie, but she is only a few feet off. Life gets very expensive. Showbiz. But despite Ida's complaints, I make my business pay for it. 1939. 40. A perfect life. He screwed up. Who screwed up? My bloody son of a bitch agent. Consolidated Foods offer me 2500 a week to appear on their program, but he's already signed me Before. to Pleasant Mentholated Cigarettes, 1000 a week. Well, it was the best offer at the time. I don't pay him 15%, 15% to make mistakes. She goes on and on all evening, while just behind her, all evening, stands her agent, Mo Levinson. Finally, a little man... He turns. I mean, really. Okay, you dirty cow. Apologize. Apologize to me. Me? Apologize to you? I got an offer for you. What? The Hollywood Bowl. The Hollywood Bowl? I got an offer for you to sing at the Hollywood Bowl. Make you famous like that. Accept them. No, no. Not so fast. It's a kind of a double offer. They take Vita Pierce or they take Opie Lucas. They leave it to me. I handle you both. An Opie, she don't cuss me out. She don't badmouth me in front of 100 folk at a Hollywood party. A contralto's no draw. She gets it if you don't <laughs> apologize. All right, Mo. I apologize. <laughs> no. Apologize after I slapped you. I'm sorry, Mr. Levinson. I'm really sorry. Please get me that booking at the bowl. Yes? Mildred, thank God I got you. Where have you been? Uh, busy. You looked at the restaurant accounts lately, I tell you. I... Ida, I can't talk now. I'm busy. Yeah, parties. Oh. <sighs> Sorry about that. This dress has got to be right. Exactly right. Speak directly to every person in the audience. This one's very nice, Vita. Bottle green, pale pink top. Oh, Mother, it's so... Glendale? Vaudeville, I was going... Hey, wait a minute. Glendale. Vida? That's it. What's the whole audience going to be at the bowl? Glendale. What's everyone across the country want? Glendale. This dress is right. And my encore? I know it. The Hollywood Bowl. I walk on glass, walk over things as though all the world, its cities, people, are mere tiny black creatures far beneath. Above, just me and my daughter Vida, creatures of light. The lights dim. The vast audience awaits. She appears, tiny, fragile. A single rose in her hand sings, sings, and sings. Then come the encores. She steps shyly forward. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much for making this evening so special for me. I was born in Glendale. Raised here. I'm Glendale through and through and proud of it. This final song means so much to me.
because it means so much to my mother. Thank you. run up and down the climax of my life also the end of my finances to pay for everything I've been using funds from my company drive home a whole fleet of cars outside merrymaking laughter within not one champagne glass or whiskey bottle or cocktail snack paid for I've got to speak to someone phone bird He's not with the widow Biderhoff anymore. We go to a speakeasy. You realize what I've done? Vita's got to kick in. Five thousand dollars have gone. Mm, so Vita can play the grand lady and Monty Polo. How much does she earn? A lot. <laughs> a lot more than you. Who the hell put that girl where she is? Paid for that music. You did your share. Mighty little. We lived well before the Depression, Bert. I've carried her for nine years, but you carried her for eleven. Vida, a burden. Nothing worse than a lot of folks have had to carry in this country. You want me to talk to her? No, Bert. It's got to be me. Me. Drive home. House dark. I go to her room. Empty. Bed hasn't been slept in. I hurry to my room. Then, Monty's. Who's there? It's Mildred. Let me in. What kind of time is this? Let me sleep. Let me in, Monty. It's about Vida. Where is she? For Christ's sake, Mildred, is she an infant? Maybe she went out. It's a free country. She couldn't have her cars in the garage. Well, couldn't she have gone with somebody else? Oh, sorry, Monty. I didn't think. Jeez, Mildred. He looks at me. I'm sorry. About to shut the door, when in his deepest eye, the serpent flicker. Who's in there? Mildred. I said, who's in there? Push past him. Switch on the light. The final horror. On Monty's bed. Naked. Legs lazily apart. Smoking a cigarette. Hello, mother. I'm across the bed, clawing. Squeezing, squeezing, squeezing at my daughter Vita's throat. Monty, pulling me. Mildred, stop! Stop it! I'll kill you! Come on, get up! Eventually, he pulls me off.
It gets into the papers. Penniless, I go to Reno for six months for a quick divorce. Even here, fate won't leave me alone. It turns out Vida's only struck dumb for as long as she's contracted to pleasant, mentholated cigarettes. As soon as they drop her contract, her voice is miraculously restored. She signs with Consolidated Foods at twice the price. All that is lacking for the golden girl of Glendale is reconciliation. Christmas Day, she and Bert turn up at my cheap motel room in Reno with presents, booze, a turkey. <laughs> Bert thinks it's genuine. I don't. <laughs> the press burst in, flash their snapshots, a family reconciled. Depart with Vida. Bert stares after her, thinking, muttering. Then, picks up a bottle of rye. Mildred? Bert? To hell with her. We done our duty as parents. We had one kid, and the poor little deer died. Yes. We had another, and now she's got her own life. And good riddance. Right. The depression's over? What the hell? Just you and me again. Hey, let's turn the music up and get stinko. I look at Bert. A slightly confused, battered-looking man. I love him. Yeah. Let's get stinko. In Mildred Pierce by James M. Kane, adapted for radio by John Fletcher. Mildred was Shelley Thompson. Vida was Cyril Jenkins. Bert, Ed Bishop, and Monty Berrigan, Martin Jarvis. Lucy Gessler was Geraldine Fitzgerald. Wally Bergen, James Telfer. Treviso, John Baddeley. Ider, Catherine Nix. Ray Pierce was Angela Shafto. Levinson, David Holt. Letty, Eugenia Warren, and the Doctor, Dominic Letts. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Original music was composed by Elizabeth Parker. Mildred Pierce was directed at Christchurch Studios in Bristol by Andy Jordan. <laughs>